Hello and welcome to today's live lesson. My name's Alan and I'm here in Cambridge, England at the British Antarctic Survey headquarters. Now the British Antarctic Survey is an amazing organisation full of scientists and engineers and people who are learning all about our planet with their research from the Arctic all the way down to the Antarctic. And it's the Antarctic we're going to focus on today, specifically a place called Rothera. Now in Rothera, there's a big science station there where people are doing lots and lots of important research. But we're going to be learning about this new building. It's called the Discovery Building, and it's currently being built for scientists and researchers to live and work in some rather extreme conditions. And while we learn about this building, we're also going to be learning about Bass's journey to net zero, how they're using sustainable, renewable energies and also thinking about well-being and how it is for people living and working in this building in Rothera. Now we'd love you to join in today and we'd like to see some of your pictures. If you're working in your classrooms, maybe you're looking at the screen and taking pictures as well, please do put them on Twitter and use the hashtag Bass Live. We'd also like you to interact with us throughout the session today, perhaps answering some questions and asking some questions. And we'd like you to do that using Slido. And here's how. To interact with today's stream, use the Slido track to the right of your screen. Downloadable resources are also available during and after the lesson. So there you go, now you know how to use Slido to interact with us during today's lesson. Now this is an amazing facility here in Cambridge and we've talked about some of the research centres in some rather extreme places around the world where the scientists and the engineers do their work and it's those people that I'm really interested in. When I was at school I learnt about Sir Ernest Shackleton and he was an explorer who went to the Antarctic three times even on his second mission getting trapped in ice and having to take his men off the boat and sail hundreds of nautical miles to safety. And he even went back a third time after that. So I'm really interested in how people live and work and what measures they have to take to survive out in these conditions. And I've been told to go and meet Matt because Matt is in charge of all the polar equipment that the scientists and engineers take to places like Rothera. Now, while I'm getting to the kit room, I want you to have a little think. A first question for you. What do you think the coldest recorded temperature in the Antarctic is to date? Now, remember, Sir Ernest Shackleton was out there over 100 years ago in the early 1900s. So there's lots of recorded temperatures. What do you think the coldest one to date is? I'm going to go downstairs to the kit room and I'll see you there. Well, here we are in the kit room. And before I asked you a question, which was, what is the coldest recorded temperature in the Antarctic? And I think the best person to answer that question is a specialist in how to keep warm in the Antarctic. And that's Matt here in the kit room. So Matt, can you tell us all, what is the coldest recorded temperature ever in the Antarctic? Minus 89.2. Minus 89.2. So well done if you got that question right. Now, if it's that cold, Matt, there's clearly a lot of stuff I need to take. And that's your area of expertise, isn't it? It is indeed, yeah. That's why I help all the scientists and staff at Bass do, yeah. And they all take their equipment out. And I've spotted behind me already a ginormous bag. I thought it was a sleeping bag or a tent because it's huge. Look at that, I could get in there myself, it's massive. And this is where all this kit goes before it's sent out. All this kit will fit in that bag, I do promise. It oh. takes a bit of squeeze, but we can get <laughs> we'll it in. Sit. I'll hold just that, we'll see. I'm going to put it out the way over here. And I'll load it as we, uh, well, I'm sure you're better at loading it than me, but I'll give it a go. So all of this equipment has to go out to help keep the scientists and the researchers warm in those very, very cold conditions. So talk us through it and tell us a little bit about the materials that are used. Cool, yeah. So as you can see, this is your kit that you need to stay safe in Antarctica. 
and we use the layering system we do then. So you've got multiple layers and they trap air and that's what keeps you really warm then. So we start with the base layers on the end here, then your mid layers, that's trapping and keeping you warm. And then your protection layers then, they protect you from the elements then. So it's about trapping the air in, in layers? It's all about trapping that air and that's what keeps you warm then. The simple rule with insulation, bigger is better. The more air you trap, the warmer you are then. Ah, right. So starting right at the beginning then, we've got your base layer. So you've got a nice top here. Let's have a look. You've got some trousers, yeah. So okay. you'll have some trousers that will go with that like, as well then. You, you don't mind if I don't try all of these on, do you? You don't want Not to see problem, me getting no. dressed. No one wants to see that. There we go. So, so these go next to the skin. The primary so this will be against my skin. Yeah, so this right. will go next to the skin. The primary function of your base layer is to draw moisture away from the body and drive it into the atmosphere then. So by keeping you dry, it keeps you warmer because once you get damp and wet you chill down so much quicker you do. So this actually keeps me dry as well? It's not necessarily keeping you dry but it's pulling that moisture away from the body and into the environment as well so it's constantly wicking that moisture away oh, from so your body. so it's keeping me then. dry from my own moisture exactly. that I create, the sweat basically. <laughs> Even though it's going to be really cold in Antarctica you're going to be working really hard then either doing science or shoveling snow or just helping your teammates as well then so you need to make sure that that sweat moving away from your body. And that word you use is wicking, so it kind of takes it away. That's it. So like a candle, it's drawing that moisture away from your body and driving it into the environment then, away from you as well then. So Fabulous. these then are merino wool, so super finely spun then, and that's what pulls the moisture away. Is that a special then. kind of wool? Is it merino wool? It comes specifically from merino wool sheep as well then. So oh, right. yeah, that's really the name cool. of the sheep. It is indeed, okay. yeah. So merino wool sheep. Right, that's the first thing in the bag. And there's a base layer for the bottom half as well? Yeah, tops and bottoms. So just as bottoms. important as each there other as go. well so then. So these are like tights. So these go right against yep. the skin. Excellent. So they would wick all of that moisture off my skin directly. Exactly. Right. So. In the bag. What's next? Next layers over the top of that. You've got some fleece layers then. So you've got a fleece top there then. Okay. So it's a, a fleecy top. Yeah. And Excellent. then very snazzy as well. You've got some fleecy salopettes as well. Okay. So these come up nice and high. Oh, so these are salopettes like you might wear if you go skiing, like all in one look. Exactly. So super important for these guys then. Come up nice and high. So your kidneys are just around here. We want to make okay. sure you're protecting those as well then. So your core organs in this region here you want to make sure you're keeping them warm and safe this is your engine this is what's keeping you warm then if you keep this nice and toasty it'll drive the heat around the rest of your body to your extremities as so well, we're actually thinking about keeping our organs warm as well not just like I would have thought about keeping my skin warm or my head warm or whatever but you're actually talking about the internal organs too yeah so what we want to do the human body it holds a temperature of about 37 degrees Celsius and once it drops below that it can become really dangerous then you can become hypothermic then and that's what we're trying to avoid at the moment then so by keeping your core warm Super important, keeps the rest of you warm as well then. Definitely in the bag then. Right, that's in two. What's next? So we got a nice puffy jacket for you to try on. So as we said earlier, bigger is better. The more air we're trapping, the warmer it's keeping you as well then. So I don't know if you'd like to give this guy yeah, a try sure. on to start with then. Let me try this on, thank you. So I've got my base layer on now. I've got my salopettes on, so my internals as well. I've got my fleece top on, and now I've got this on too. I'm just gonna make sure I don't not my microphone as well, so that goes up there. Oh, it's quite a nice fit, that. So that's like what that. we're looking for, yeah. We're looking for Goldilocks in terms of fit. We don't want it to be too big, because if it's too big, it's allowing cold air to circulate underneath and steal away that warm air you've built up. And if it's too tight, it's restrictive then. It's potentially going to cut off circulation, which is bad, because again, you're taking that warm blood from your core all the way to your extremities as well then. And it's just restrictive. You're not going to be able to work in your environment as well then. So it's all about getting the right size for your scientists and Most And this is your job, making sure they're all kitted out properly. Definitely. We care everyone out. So from little ladies down to this big to huge six foot, seven foot giants then, Sarah. So we need all sorts of people to go south for us. Amazing. What's next? So I'm feeling warmer already. Fantastic. <laughs> Over the top of that, we've got some waterproof and windproof trousers then. So again, nice and high. So it's protecting your okay. core as well then. And then we've got a jacket, same sort so of material as well. So this is as well, well as the other Salopet things. That are, so wow, we really are layering up everywhere, are Most we? definitely. That's as I say, amazing. it's those layers. It's trapping the air. It's keeping you warm. But not only that, this is going to protect you from the wind as well then. So you might come across wind chill as well then. So that's the sensation. So your skin builds up warmth next to it. The wind comes in and takes on? that warmth. If you would like to put it on, yeah. I'm pretending to be an uh, Antarctic scientist. Here we go. I'm trying not to knock the microphone. Sorry if you're... Oh, wow. How's it looking? 
All right, you're looking proper now. <laughs> Great. Okay. Fantastic. So this Another is the, layer. Yeah, yeah. Loads, <laughs> loads of layers. We're not okay. done yet either. <laughs> okay. So this layer here is going to protect you from the wind it is then. So it'll stop the wind coming through, getting chilled as well, but it's also going to keep the water off as well, snow melt then. So again, like with the base layers, once you get wet then, you chill down so much quicker. So this is the first waterproof layer, is it? That this I've is got? the first waterproof okay, layer. Okay, so this is the sort of thing I could wear out in the elements and... Most definitely, yeah. yeah. Okay, got but it. But the thing is, Antarctica is so cold most of the time, especially deep continent then, all the water is already frozen, so we don't need to worry quite so much about it being liquid oh, then. Okay. It's all about keeping the wind off you more than anything as well. I haven't then. thought of that, but I was thinking waterproofs, but obviously the water is already ice. Du dual purpose, yeah, it's super Amazing. cool, isn't it? Okay, yeah, so. right, what's next? Well, if you're up for it, we've got some even bigger insulated jackets you can put Absolutely. on now as well Let's then. Let's do it. This looks like a beast. So we've got this guy here then. So this is what you'd wear whilst you are either stationary because you're not moving not putting a lot of heat out then or if you're on something like a skidoo for example then right so okay. again it's going to be fast moving wind as you're traveling on the skidoo you're going to be quite static as well so you want to trap as much of that warmth as well wow this is a bit i've never worn anything like this before so the best way of thinking oh. of this bit of kit then is essentially it's a duvet it with a arms duvet. in it wow Wow, it, it, really, it is like being inside the hottest duvet ever. That's so warm. And what sort of insulation material are we talking about here? So we use down in this particular jacket, so from feathers of birds then, and then it, what it does is it traps the air again then. So they're fine spindly feathers they are then, that trap that air then. And okay. as I said, insulation, bigger is better. Right. The more puffy you are, <laughs> the warmer you're going to be then. So you wouldn't really necessarily work in something like this because you just get too hot then. Yeah, yeah. So for guys who are standing around monitoring equipment then, they'd have something like this on. Or as I said, in your skidoo as well then. And then we've also got some snazzy trousers that you could wear with them as well then. Wow, so these are the same sort of material, that really puffy yeah. material. Fabulous. I'm not going to put those on as well. At the no, moment. no. I'll be dripping in sweat. Okay, so now we get to the last part of our kit bag let's talk through this what have we got so hands feet face they're the real vulnerable parts of your body then they're furthest away from the cord the blood's got to go the furthest to travel there as well so it's really important that we have warm hands and feet as well then so we got lots of boots for you to wear and thick socks as well so really big chunky wool socks then we can issue to people i can see already that they if you can see on there then merino as well. So we've got that merino on there too. So dual Excellent. purpose is pulling that moisture away and it's trapping air to keep you nice and warm there. Great. And then your feet would then sit very snugly in a set of these big boots as well, well then. <laughs> so these are our standard boots and then those are our deep seal boots. <laughs> you know what I'm going to say, don't you? How heavy? Oh, I couldn't tell you. It depends how big your feet really, are in all honesty. <laughs> that's so. a good point. They're really, really, I know you can't see that in your classrooms, obviously, but they're so heavy. Wow, and then they're obviously tough, they're reinforced, they're safety boots as well. Yeah. They've got an inner layer as well in there, all the lacing up and really, really solid. And then on the soles, we've got all of these pointy, grippy base. Yeah, so you want dual purpose, so it's nice and wide, so you're spreading the weight across a big surface area, so you're not going to sink into the snow then. And again, you're getting that grip on it as well then, so it bites into the snow, so you're not going to be slipping and sliding around as well then. Yeah, they're like, like crampons already on the boot, aren't they? Halfway there, Amazing. yeah. Amazing, they're fabulous. And I've got a couple of pair of boots, these don't look as, as beefy. No, so you don't always need super warm boots as well. For use on station, we've got different levels of insulation as well. It's finding the most appropriate bit of equipment for the situation you're in as well. So it's not just taking one item of, or one set of clothing. You've got to think about all the different conditions, different kinds of boots, different kinds of gloves, I take it, as well. Most definitely. It's about being dynamic. So, for example, if you were shoveling snow, you're going to be working really hard. You might just be in a fleece top then and your trousers. But then if you stood still monitoring some scientific equipment, you're going to need something like you're wearing at the moment then to trap all that heat because you're not going to be moving as well then. Right. So it's about being dynamic and thinking about what you're going to do as well. Great. Am I seeing sunglasses here? <laughs> not just for style, super important as well then. So like you can get sunburn on the skin, you can also sunburn your eyes then, which is really, really? dangerous. 
So these sunglasses are important because they block out all the UV light that comes through as well, which is what causes sunburn as well. And snow blindness is how it's referred to for this as well then. So they filter out all the UV, they're really dark because it's going to be so bright as well. And then they've got the side protection on there as well, because not only have you got light uh, coming yeah. at you from above, the sun's going to be super low in the sky and it's going to be bouncing off the snow and reflecting at you as well then. So it's about having that 360 Good protection. protection. All around. And if you need even more protection, you've got some goggles there as well. So they do the same thing. And then if you're on your skidoo again, you've got even more protection. I put these on. Please do, yeah. <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah, it's gone dark. <laughs> <laughs> wow, they're great. So we've got our eyes protected because you said face is important. Very much And so. then we've talked about our feet. Yeah. We've got some hats, hats and gloves. Yeah, so you've got your hats and your buff as well to protect your neck. And the last thing we'll mention are your gloves as well. So we give loads of gloves because of all the sorts of different work you'll do. From really thin ones for when you're just touching metal objects because your hands will freeze to them then, all the way to big chunky mitts on the end then. These so have I, my eye. Yeah, please do. <laughs> Again, big heavy, heavy gloves and really thick material. These are for people working in extreme conditions. So again, that's going to do work for that stationary work then. You want something that's going to be nice and warm. So the cool thing about mitts is it reduces the surface area, which means your hand is keeping itself much warmer it is as well then. The big problem is you lose your dexterity though, you can't do yeah, anything. Yeah, I'm thinking that, there's not much I can do with that hand now. Not at all, yeah. so you can't tie your laces, you can't take a drink, you couldn't take the top off the water bottle there, no, you know. No, I'd really struggle. Yeah, you're right. So it's about learning how to operate in these conditions as well, so we give you loads of different styles of gloves so you can figure out what's gonna work best for you. And some of them I can see here, this one's even got the temperature you should be, uh, you, you could be wearing this down to, you could it's be, minus yeah. 30 degrees. And we know it gets cold down there, so there's a minus 30 degree glove there for us to wear too. So we've got our boots, we've got our gloves. I can't believe it's all going to fit in there. I'm definitely not even going to try. I know that was my <laughs> intention, but I'm going to leave that to you. We've got hats. These look great as well. There we go. Oh, that's already warm. Oh, that's great, isn't it? So we've got our hats. Now, I've got a question for you. <laughs> All this stuff goes in the bag. That's your personal kit as a scientist or a researcher or as an engineer. But this is all to this is all essential kit to keep you alive essentially. What about personal things? What about taking, you know, something to to keep you busy when you're bored or you've got some downtime? What sort of things do the, the people you work with who are going out there, what do they take? They can't take the PlayStation, they can't take the dog. You know, what do they take with them? Well, dog is definitely off limits, I'm afraid. <laughs> I'm not sure they'd be too happy about being down there. But you could take your games console if you really wanted. Oh, you could. Yeah. You can get really creative with what you need to, to keep yourself busy and entertained down there. So we've seen people take things like DJ decks. Um, wow. Yeah, all the way to games consoles. But even old school, like books. Uh, loads of reading gets done down there as well. You can put it all on a Kindle if you really want to as well, and then you're just taking one book out of Ah, yes. good idea. Um, hobbies are really important, so things like model making they do a lot of. Fancy dress is a big thing as well then, because you need a bit of play as well, which is really exciting. Okay. So whatever you can think of to keep yourself entertained and busy down there, yeah. Amazing. What would you take? I'm a sucker for Lego sets, I am. I think I'd have to have something to keep me busy, keep my you hands occupied when I get my Amazing. downtime, yeah. Okay, fabulous. Right, I am looking like I am ready to go to the Antarctic. I now need to find out how I'm going to get to the Antarctic. Matt, who should I speak to next? I think it'd be Katie you need to speak to next. Okay, Katie's one of your project managers? I believe so, yeah. Right, I will go and find Katie. Now, while I'm going to go and find Katie, I've got a question for you. What would you take to the Antarctic with you if you were going? So imagine your kit bag is full of all this essential gear. What luxury item would you take? What would you take for those cold winter evenings when you're a bit bored? What would you take to do with other scientists down there? Maybe some games and things. Have a little think and fill in my word cloud for me in Slido while I go and find project manager Katie. Thank you so much for today, Matt. I am dripping inside here. Perfect. <laughs> well, you'll be warm enough for when you get to Antarctica. Then. I will indeed. We'll see you with Katie in the mission room.
Well, here we are back in the studio. I am literally still sweating from all of those clothes. So thanks so much to Matt, who got us all dressed up. And I'm, I'm so warm after all of that lovely insulation I had up there. And now I'm down here with Katie and David. But before we go to our special guests, I'm gonna have a quick look at your word cloud because I believe that there's lots of people who want to take a football to the Antarctic. So interesting, I wonder if they do play football down there. But lots of great answers on the word cloud. So thanks so much for sharing all your thoughts there. And now here we are with Katie and David. Now Matt told us we had to find you, Katie, because I asked him how people get down to Rotherit in the Antarctic. And he said, somebody you need to speak to is Katie, because she had quite an eventful journey, is that right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so back in 2020, um, during coronavirus, um, we needed to quarantine for two weeks before going down to the Antarctic to stop coronavirus getting there. Um, and so we ended up quarantining in, in the UK for two weeks, then heading down on the SDA, right from Harwich, uh, right down to the Falklands, and then over to Rotherham. And Bridge. the SDA is the Sir David Attenborough ship. Yeah. This is it behind us, I believe, isn't it? So this is where yeah. you live? Yeah. And how long were you on board for from the UK all the way to the Antarctic? So I was on board for five weeks um, and yeah we spent time um, just doing our normal work in the offices but we also uh, spent time helping the ship's crew so doing cleaning, doing a bit of work on deck and um, doing a little bit of helping out with uh, the engine rooms and we got tours of the engine rooms as well. So it wasn't a cruise, it wasn't a relaxing five no, weeks for no. you? No, we had to work, yep. And we can see that the ship here, the Sir David Attenborough, that's actually making its way because it can cope in, in all those icy conditions, can't it? Yeah. That's mm -hmm. amazing, and that was how you got there. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Now, tell us, David, thank you for joining us. David, when the scientists and the researchers and people like Katie get down to Rothera, What's it like down there? We can see it here. So what's it like down there at the moment before the finish, uh, the completion of the, the discovery? Yeah, so the staff are operating from those smaller green buildings that you can see on that image behind. And uh, there's obviously lots of them. And, uh, and what you see there is a, a station really that's quite clear of snow, but the snow can certainly build up um, over the course of the, uh, the year. And that presents lots of problems for us because you have to keep on getting in and out of all that clothing that you saw earlier to get between these buildings, uh, which is time consuming and, uh, and, and also you know, quite a burden. And, uh, and also we've got to cl clear the snow around those buildings so we can actually get access um, into them and right. out of them. And that's, uh, that takes a long time every year to clear, to clear snow. So um, that's the challenge uh, for us. And what we're trying to do, as you can see here from the Discovery Building, is to bring all those different buildings into one. Right. And that means we won't have to um, walk between those buildings. And the great thing about this, uh, this building is that it, it has a sort of uh, spinal corridor that goes from one end to the other. Um, so you'd actually have, you don't actually have to leave the building at all to get to different parts of it. So you're not taking your boots and all yeah. those layers that I've just taken off. You don't have to take them off and put them back on again. Yeah, and, and this building is about well, just short of uh, the size of a football pitch. So it's a fairly long building. Uh, and so it's great that you can work and move in that building without having to go outside. Other, other advantages of this is you can see it's a nice blue colour, uh, a light blue, which means it doesn't pick up so much of the, uh, the solar radiation, the, the, the heat from the sun. And so we can make sure that the, the, the steel on the, um, on the building doesn't expand and contract with that change in the solar radiation. Now we, so can, we can see that steel there because the, this is how it looks at the moment before it's, uh, before it's finished. How, how big is that? Because we can see it's a lot bigger than the, the chaos of all the other buildings that are strewn there. So we've got this big building. How big is that? Well, it's 90 metres in length, 30 metres wide and about 14 metres high. So it's, it's sizeable. It's the, one of the biggest buildings um, that the British Antarctic Survey has put, put down in the Antarctic. About the size of a football pitch? Yep, yeah, about the size like of that. a football pitch, yes. And, um, and what you can also see as well is it's got this sort of curve still along the, the full length of oh, the, uh, here, the building. Yeah, yeah. And the idea of that is that it shapes the wind over the south side of the building so it tries to scour and clear the snow away from the building so we don't have to do any snow clearing right ah, up close to the building. Very well. clever, very yeah. clever. Now, obviously it's not finished, but I do believe we've got a CGI. Now, a CGI is where very clever media people make a video of what it might look like when it's finished or what it will look like when it's finished. And we've got that here behind us. So this isn't a real video, but David's going to tell us a little bit about how it's going to look when it's finished. Yeah, so it's broken down into three zones. Um, 
to, in order to support the operation um, on, uh, on Rothera. And as you can see, we're going through the main entrance there and, and into the building. Um, one of the first things that we're going to see is the boot rooms, where everyone takes their boots off and keeps them so they can actually move around the building without having all their snow-covered boots on. Um, we're now in the medical centre, and that's really important for us because of the, uh, you know, the, how dangerous environment it is to work in there, so we need to make sure we've got good uh, medical facilities. This building as well provides a lot of preparation areas to, uh, for the scientists and field guides to go uh, out, out to the Antarctic to and also a sort of central store, a storage facility. You can't just go down to the local shops no. to get what you need. You need to plan ahead and make sure you've got all the stores all centrally in one, in one building. There's also workshop space as well, um, so people can work on the, uh, the sledges and the, and the skis they need uh, to go out onto the, uh, onto the ice. And this building as well provides a number of the systems that we need to support the, support the station, so the power, the heating, the fresh water, um, and it does this in a really energy efficient way so that we can try and reduce our carbon our use of uh, fossil fuels. There's also a vehicles garage um, as well to maintain all the, uh, the vehicles that we use, particularly the snow clearing vehicles, which are very big. Very important and very big. Um, but the other great thing about the building as well, it's where people can socialise and relax. So there's plenty of, um, you know, sort of uh, social areas with table tennis tables and there's even a climbing wall. There's a gym, a sauna. Uh, an arts and crafts centre and a music room. Wow. So there are places to unwind as well. Amazing. Now, when we were in the kit room, and you may have heard me talking to the, the children as well a minute ago about what they would take if they were in the Antarctic. So before we move on and I leave you, I've got to ask, what would be your sort of luxury item, the thing you'd take from home when you go to the Antarctic? What did you take? Uh, so I took um, some of my own snacks, um, so you get fed really well at, at the research stations and you get like four meals a day, which is great, but it's always nice to have like your one favourite food to take down or so your go few favourite foods. Is it? Oh, it'd just be like nice chocolate or like uh, popcorn and crisps, so yeah. Mm -hmm. Excellent, those little treats from home. What about mm -hmm. yourself, David? Uh, I'll take my own sunglasses, um, although right. you do get a pair. Um, yeah, I had some a minute ago, yeah. Mark, yeah. <laughs> but uh, no, I got, I got my pair and... Uh, and they're really important because of the, the solar glare you get from the uh, reflection of the, uh, the sunlight from the snow. So having a good pair of sunglasses definitely helps. It means you can go up onto the, uh, onto the mountains and uh, you know, go for nice walks and, uh, and see the environment all around us. Wonderful. Well, you've talked about going off into the mountains and I, that's where I'm going to go and find out a little bit more about how people get around in those snowy, icy conditions. And that's your next question. I'm going to ask you, what do you think the vehicles are that they use to get around the snowy, icy conditions in the Antarctic? Pop your answers in and I'll see you in our next location. Thank you so much for filling that in everybody. I can see your responses. Lots of snowmobiles, lots of skidoos coming into that word cloud. And uh, I think you might be right. And I'm here with the right person to ask because this is Ben. Ben, lovely to meet you. Tell Thank us you where we are. Well, here we're here in Cambridge in the UK workshops working for British Antarctic Survey. Here in the workshops. And what's your role here? So I'm the vehicles manager looking after the, uh, all the vehicles that work in the Antarctic. Wow. And have you ever been to the Antarctic yourself? I have. I, my first stint was back in 2000, nearly 22 years ago, and did three years in the Antarctic without coming home. Three years without actually, not Christmas or birthdays? No Christmas, no birthdays, all in the Antarctic. And you actually lived all that time down there in the Antarctic? I did, through the winters as well, yeah. So nearly 120 days of total darkness in, at Halley Station. It sounds terrible. Did you hate it? Loved it. Loved every minute of it. <laughs> really? Oh, yes. Would you go back? I would, yeah. Have you been back a lot since? Or? Yeah, well, I spent nearly 18 years uh, uh, of every single season post my winter in the Antarctic after that, yeah. Oh, so you're an expert. I love it. It's the best place. And tell us, when you're down there, obviously these are the vehicles that people are using to get around and do their job, whether they're scientists or researchers or staff down there. Can you tell us a little bit about these vehicles? So these are snowmobiles. We have about 80 snowmobiles in the Antarctic. That's eight zero. Um, all looking after the scientists working for projects in the Antarctic. Um, whether that be geology and science, ice and climate, 
Um, so these are all the snowmobiles. We have Honda quad bikes and, and s bigger and smaller snowmobiles working the Antarctic for us. Now, I can see that it looks a little bit like a motorbike. It's got the single seat there. It's got the handlebars, the displays, but no wheels on this. So obviously for the snow, we're talking skis at the front. Am I yeah, right? We are indeed. So skis on the front of these traditionally because we need to float over the top of the snow whilst we're driving over the snow. And then we have big rubber tracks on the back to oh, give yeah. us traction to tow nearly one ton behind some of these snowmobiles whilst we're going along the Antarctic. Oh, they're used for towing as well? Towing as well, so we have to tow all of our safety equipment behind these, so when you're out in the field you need to look after yourself, so your tents, your food will all go behind your snowmobile. I'd thought that these were just for getting people from A to B, but it's actually equipment for, for as well. For projects and equipment in the Amazing. Antarctic. And why is there a spade <laughs> strapped to the so side the of this one? The spade is the most precious bit of bit kit, so if you break down in the middle of a snowstorm, you can dig yourself a hole in the snow and get yourself into a little ice igloo, and then that keeps you out of the weather and keeps you warm and keeps you safe. Oh, so it's not for if the skidoo gets stuck, this it's is, for, it's this is to, keep for you you. to keep you safe and warm if you break wow. down. Wow, amazing. And then obviously this is just a, a different kind of skidoo and this one does, doesn't have any skis on it. This has the traditional wheels. So what, tell us a little bit about this one. Well, this one's brand new, just got delivered today. So uh, this is Brang's Bank in New and this is going into a, a geology project on Seymour Island on the Antarctic Peninsula. And you can see it's on wheels, so this be working predominantly on rock this season. Okay, so this isn't for the snow, and it's just arrived today? Just arrived today, and so you could be the first one to sit on it. Should we be the first people to say, come with me, let's be the first group of people. You can do it virtually, I'll do it properly. Here we go, planting my bottom on your lovely new quad bike. And this is going on the, the Sir David Attenborough, the ice David Attenborough this season, yeah. But we've just been uh, learning uh, about how you get to the Antarctic and we, we saw the Sir David Attenborough going through the ice, so that was amazing. And this is going to go on the Sir David Attenborough all the way down to the Antarctic. It is indeed. This will be loaded amazing. in September this year going into the Antarctic. And we are the first people to... I thought it was a bit shiny <laughs> for a quad bike. So I've got a question for you. You don't have many garages down there to get your fuel. So how do these vehicles get their fuel? So all our fuel is loaded in the UK and will go in on the sedated Rambra and then get put into our stations, Rother and Halley, with our ships. And then we deploy it from the station with our aircraft, our twin otters, and then we get to support these ones in the field. So they go in big drums into the field and then we refuel from those drums um, with just a windy pump for the most part. So the fuel goes on the ship with the quad bike. It does indeed. And, they, and then it goes out from there to where it's needed. Now, the students, the children at home will know that obviously a lot of things are moving towards electric. We've got electric scooters, we've got electric bikes, we've got lots of electric cars. Are any of these electric? Is there such a thing as an electric skidoo? There are indeed. That's our next move. So all these in the coming years will turn into electric snowmobiles and electric quad bikes when we go into our renewable energy. And at that point, they'll be much, much quieter and much more environmentally friendly to use in the Antarctic. Amazing. Now, I know that Bass is really, really passionate about protecting the planet and has lots and lots of big strategies around renewable energy and sustainability. And you've got somebody who's in your workshop here. She's going to come over and join us. Come on in, Natalia. Hello, Natalia. Hi there. Hi, lovely to meet you. Um, can you tell us a little bit about your job and what Bass is doing to be more sustainable and look after our planet? Sure. Um, so my name is Natalia. My job is sustainability manager for our projects office, um, which is in charge of building all the nice new shiny buildings down in Antarctica. Um, and yeah, the reason that we're building down there is because we do want to uh, make Rothera, which is our main station, a um, as close to net zero emissions as possible. Um, so we are putting in some really interesting renewable energy infrastructure down there, um, which is going to work with the Discovery Building um, and its new energy efficient uh, plant down there. Um, and hopefully by 2040, we'll be a net zero organisation. And what exactly does that mean to someone who doesn't know perhaps what being a net zero organisation, what does that mean and why is that so important? So net zero means that we have basically tried to reduce our fossil fuel footprint as much as possible preferably down to zero, um, but in Antarctica that's quite difficult, so there might be a little bit of fossil fuel usage left over, um, and we'll have done everything possible to make sure that we're not using fossil fuels. That's what net zero means. Okay, so you're doing your very best to use as little fossil fuel as possible to operate those stations in those places. So tell us how are you doing that, because that sounds pretty tricky. It is quite tricky. Down in Antarctica, what we have is a combination of 
sunlight for about six months of the year and lots of wind. And we don't have any power plants down there, so we have to get our energy, our renewable energy, from the wind and the sun for the most part. So we're thinking about putting wind turbines uh, down there, some solar PV panels, and another technology called solar thermal as well, and using a combination of all of that to try and get our fossil fuel footprint down as much as possible. Okay, so it's the sort of things that we're used to seeing here back, uh, you know, not in the Antarctic, back where we have our schools and our homes with solar panels. Yeah. And we do see wind turbines, sometimes at sea, sometimes up on hills where they're catching the wind. But what you're trying to do is use a mix of all of those to be as efficient as possible. Yeah, because we can't rely on just one. So if we've only got sunlight for six months of the year, then we obviously need something when it's uh, dark down in Antarctica so that's when we'll rely more on other technologies like wind. We're also going to use a lot of battery storage um, to try and make sure that our energy supply is really stable so we don't have lots of peaks and lots of troughs um, around all that energy coming in. So if the wind is getting really really strong we'll be able to supply lots of power in that moment but then it might drop off and then we need energy to come from somewhere so that's where the batteries come in. So you store it in those batteries yeah. for later as well mm -hmm. so you use the right kind of renewable energy at the right time of year that takes into account the seasons and when it's light and yeah. when it's dark and then utilizing and harnessing all that wind that comes in that we've learned about today some of the conditions so it's utilizing that as well and storing it for yeah. another day. Well, it sounds like you're doing a fabulous job to help Bass to achieve that vision of becoming more and more, well, closer to net zero. And, of course, making sure that that Discovery Building is somewhere wonderful for people like Ben who have to go and live and work down there in the Antarctic. Right, I'm going to go back to the mission room. And before I do, I'm going to leave you with this question to answer while I'm making my way over there. Okay, so this is the moment we have been really, really excited about bringing to you live. We're going to make contact, hopefully, fingers crossed, you better all cross your fingers in your classrooms around the world, because we're going to try and have a phone call with the Antarctic. Now, that's not as easy as it might sound. So we've been told that this doesn't happen very often because it's very, very difficult to contact Antarctica. So we are going to use a, a voice over internet phone, which means that we're going to rely on an internet connection, so via satellites, to try and make a call. And I'll show you where we're going to try and call. So we know that this part here, this is Discovery Building, that isn't, isn't finished yet, so it's not in there because there's no phones in there yet. But then we've got over here, the, uh, that's the old Bransfield building here, the one that's got the tower on. And that's the tower they're using at the moment until they can use this one on the new building. So we've got the old Bransfield building and in there they've got their offices and that's the control tower and that's where we're going to try and phone now. So bear with us, this is live and we're hoping it's going to work. We've got my colleague Peter who's going to dial them now. So he's calling the, here we go, it's ringing, here we go. It's very tense in the studio here. Everybody's keeping... Ev Hi, is that Chris? Hello, is that Chris? It is. Hi. It is. Hi, Chris. Uh, thank you for taking our call. We are, we're live with over 10,000 children from all over the world. So everybody is very, very happy that we've made connection. Um, so first of all, um, thank you for joining us and, and tell us how long have you been out there? So I've only been here for a few weeks, but there are plenty of people on the station here who have been here for uh, six months or more. Wow, we, we met Ben today who was out there for three years without coming home and he was, uh, he was telling us how wonderful it is out there. Are you enjoying yourself already? Very much so. This is my third time 
uh, working in Rothera for British Antarctic Survey, and I wouldn't be coming back if I didn't enjoy it. Oh, amazing, amazing. What's your favourite thing about working out there? I think it's probably the people that you get to work with. Uh, people from all walks of life, many different professions. You've got you know, doctors, you've got technicians, you've got um, you know, climbing experts and Antarctic experts, you've got scientists. You know, we still have plumbers and we still have electricians. We have people building buildings. We have healthcare and everything else. Amazing, absolutely amazing. Well, we're going to go to one of our star questions, actually, um, which is from Olivia Bell, and that's from Class 5 to Dick in JCP, Jersey College Prep in Jersey. And her question is coming to you right now. What are you researching or working on in the Antarctic at the moment? Thank you for the question, Olivia. I hope you're doing well in Jersey. I am working on the Discovery Building, and that's one of the first and biggest steps in a drug work to modernise the British Antarctic Survey facilities here in Antarctica. BAS has a very long history of exploration and providing val valuable research to the international community through its various science campaigns over the years. And Rothera, where I am, is also known as the gateway to Antarctica on this side of the continent because a lot of aircraft pass every year it's really important then that BAS has a robust facility for people to work and that's beneficial for a lot of stakeholders around the world. That's fantastic. Oh, we've learned so much. And what you didn't realise, Chris, is that we've, we're actually sat in front of a model of how the Discovery Building will look uh, when it's finished. And we've also got a picture on display of the Discovery Building as it looks now. So that's, uh, it's brilliant to have heard so much about that. Another question from one of our viewers that's come in. Um, it's from Nathan in Bromborough on the Wirral in the northwest of England. And his question is, what animals have you seen in the Antarctic? And as you've only been there a few weeks, I think we'll allow you to use all of your uh, experience of in, the, in the Antarctic to answer that question. Okay, so thanks, Nathan. Nathan, yes, Nathan in Bromborough. Nathan in Bromborough. So uh, the obvious one that everyone always asks about is penguins. And we have seen a lot of penguins. They, one of them come here, and then they molt and they shed their feathers. So you can see them going through different stages of their life. We also see a lot of seals. There's a few different types that we see here. Uh, Weddell seals, uh, crab eater seals, and occasionally we see leopard seals. So they're always here every year. And they're sunbathing on the snow and on the rocks, which is interesting to see. We get a lot of other um, types of birds apart from penguins. We get skewers and um, cormorants. They're here and a lot of them nest nearby. So we have to be very careful here in the station that we don't disturb their nesting site. And if we're really lucky, we get to see things like orca whales. And sometimes they swim around as a little family and they're playing around on the ice uh, and underneath it. And we get to see some of them as well. It sounds absolutely fantastic. It sounds like you're living in an incredible zoo out there. Wow, you're so lucky. I've got a question for you here, and I think it links back to a conversation that we had with Matt in the kit room earlier. And he was telling us that people take all different kinds of things to keep them entertained. Some people do model making, some people learn a new skill, some people take lots and lots of books. And I wondered, Chris, well, this question wonders what it is that you've taken to do in your uh, leisure time in the Antarctic? Probably the most important item for me is a camera because I get to see all of this wildlife and I get to see snowy mountains and I get to see icy seas and it's really easy to you know, forget that and that's why I brought a camera and you know, almost every day I'm out there and I take a few photos with my camera or with my phone so that I can remember the time and the people that I, I spent this time with. 
Okay, that's a great answer, a camera. I hadn't thought of that one, and it's not one that Matt mentioned earlier either, so that's great. Okay, I'm going to go to our last question because it's a really, really great question, especially as we've been learning all about the Discovery Building today. And we were learning about the different features of the Discovery Building from saunas and gyms and climbing walls. And the question is, which feature in the Discovery Building is Chris most looking forward to when it's finished? I will be definitely looking forward to going to the gym and using the sauna. It's really important to stay fit if you come and come to a polar environment like Antarctica. Uh, you know, we do a lot of training and we have to stay in good shape in order to continue our work here. Having said that, well, the other really important part of the new discovery building is the hospital. We, tr we look after people as best we can, and we hope that we never have to use it. The new discovery building has a full hospital with a small ward, a doctor's office, and a pharmacy. So if anybody does get injured or they get sick, they can be looked after by one of the doctors here on station. And that's a really important feature for everyone when they're out here. Wonderful. Thank you so much for your time today, Chris. I know you're very, very busy out there and we need to move on here in our live lesson too. But thank you so much for joining us on the phone. We managed to keep the connection so all the children in their classrooms can uncross their fingers now because we were really hoping the connection would happen for us and it has. So thank you, Chris. Enjoy the rest of your time in that wonderful environment out there and stay nice and warm and safe. Thank you, Alan. It's been good to talk to you. I hope you've learned something and I hope it's been interesting. Wasn't that fantastic getting to speak to people who are actually out there in the Antarctic right now, live with your questions. That was amazing. And don't forget, if you've got some more questions, it's not too late to get them in for Ben and Natalia, who are going to be joining me here in the studio in a few minutes' time. But what a great day we've had here at the British Antarctic Survey headquarters in Cambridge, England. We've met amazing people as we have found out what it's like to live and work and even get to the Antarctic. We met Matt first of all, who got us all of our lovely warm kit so that we could survive in those very, very challenging temperatures and conditions. And then we met David and Katie, who told us all about how to get to the Antarctic and a little more about this incredible building, the Discovery Building, that's being built as we speak. And then we went to the engineering workshop where I got to sit on the brand new quad bike and we met Ben and Natalia, who told us all about how people get around in the Antarctic, but also what Bass is doing to be more sustainable and use those important renewable energies like solar and wind. Then, of course, we've just had our amazing call with the people who are live right now in the Antarctic. What an amazing day, what amazing people we've met. Now, don't forget, we've got your chance to ask some more questions to Ben and Natalia, who are gonna join me in the studio right after you've had one last chance to send those messages and questions in on Slido. Great, well, how fabulous was that? It's great to have so many wonderful people that we've been able to meet today. And I've been told off as well. This is the problem with doing things live. I've been told off by the crew here because I was so excited to meet Chris on the phone that I forgot to give you the answer before. So my fault. The question was, uh, what, was the, what is the world's largest source of renewable energy? And I think you lot need the answer actually because 68 of you voted for solar 
And actually, the right answer was hydropower, and that only got six votes. So if you're one of those people that got six votes, congratulations to you. And I'm just going to do a few quick shout outs for, for a few schools as well from around the world. We've got Orchard C of e, hello to you. We've got Seven Oaks Primary, Bearwood Primary. We've got St. David's Primary in Germany. We've got St. Louis School in Italy. We've got the Westminster International School in the Sudan. We've got CFA homeschoolers from the Philippines. Welcome to you guys too. The Muslin School and we've got Woolacombe School who are actually studying Frozen Kingdoms at the moment. Wow. So that's perfect. What a great topic, Frozen Kingdoms. So sorry I can't say hi to everybody, but we are rapidly running out of time. I've been told off because I know we're over time. So if you're a teacher who thought this was going to end in 45 minutes, I do apologise. But I hope you can see that it's been worth it going over time today. Um, so thank you very much to our special guest in the studio. I've got the questions that have been coming in throughout the, uh, throughout the, the lesson. And there's so many, there are so many, we can't possibly go through them all. So I'm gonna ask you for some quick fire answers, okay? Have you ever made a snowman in Antarctica? That's from Harry Cliff. Hi, Harry. Uh, yes, definitely. Lots and lots of snowmen and snow angels as well. I think so snow angels comes up as well. I've seen that great, one popping up great. a few times. Snowman? Yes, snow, snow snowman and igloos. Yeah, igloos? And yeah, no, it's an amazing place to dig snow and make snowmen. Okay, well, one of the questions was, do you live in an igloo? And I wasn't going to read that one out because I, I thought, well, we've answered that question already. I have. If you spend any time in the Antarctic, you get a chance to make your own ice igloo and you can and, and put lights in there. It's brilliant. And you showed us the spade. Yes, exactly. The spade. There exactly. we go. We know all about that. We learned about that. Um, is it difficult to walk in all that clothing? Because obviously we got the clothes off Matt. Is it difficult to walk in all that clothing? So for me, definitely. I think... Um, lots of clothing manufacturers, they make it for sort of big burly men who go out to the Antarctic, but actually all kinds of people go out to the Antarctic of any shape and size now. So when you're short, it's actually really difficult to move around with so many layers, but hopefully that is actually getting better now. They're, they're changing their, they're changing, their yeah. designs. Oh, well, that's good to hear. Um, Taryn asks, how deep is the snow? I guess that changes. Changes pretty much every year, I'd say, yeah. So during the summertime, especially at Rother, there's very little snow because we've moved it all. And, but during the wintertime, that can be three, four, five metres deep on station. Five metres? And that's, uh, yeah, quite hard to walk along. Yeah. yeah. Wow, that's huge. Um, I'm going to ask this question. Have you ever seen a polar bear? Not in the Antarctic, I'm afraid, because they're all in the Ar Antarctic. So you have to go to the North Pole to see your polar bears. So there was quite a lot of questions came in about polar bears. Can you eat a polar bear? Have you ever been attacked by a polar bear? but not in the Antarctic children, so don't worry. Um, have you had a snowball fight? Okay, have you ever been attacked by a penguin? Well, I spent, uh, I was lucky enough to spend a winter down at Halley Station and got very close to the emperor penguins that stand about a metre high. And if you're, we're supposed to be like uh, five metres away from them, but if you huddle down and kneel down in front of the penguins, they'll actually come up to you and start huddling around you and, and sort of like almost pretend to keep you warm at the same time. So attacked, no, but you'll be loved by them. Really, they're lovable characters. Oh, definitely. They? And you've been told to stay five metres away, but no one gave them the memo. They have no Antar <laughs> They have no predators on land, so you're just seen as a friend, not foe. So they're not scared at all? Yeah. How lovely is that, to be in an environment where these animals just don't feel threatened by us humans? That's beautiful. OK, so let's find another quick question. What's the warmest you've ever had it in Antarctica? We talked about the coldest uh, about an hour ago now, 89.2 degrees, I think. Well, minus 89.2 was the coldest. What's the warmest you've had? Um, the warmest I've experienced is around 10 degrees, but I do know that there are parts of Antarctica, particularly because of climate change, that have seen temperatures rise to up to 18, 19 degrees. Um, so yeah, it, it, it does vary across the continent quite a lot, but um, me personally, only about 10. Right, there's a question that's come in for you from Andrew, and it's asking, after so much time in the Antarctic, do you prefer the snow or the sun? Well, luckily enough, you get, uh, if during the summertime down there, you have 24 hour daylight, and sunshine blue sky so you get to experience both at the same time so I would say equally the snow and the sun in the Antarctic summertime is brilliant. Amazing. Um, Liv and Ellie have asked about the snow angel again but we know about that now. Torsten asks have you ever gone outside and been blown off your feet because of a blizzard? or any other bad weather, I would have guessed. I have, yes, definitely. I've actually uh, been blown away on ice. We have a blue ice runway down at Rothera, um, just a Rothera Ant Antarctic station, and you can get blown away 50, 60 knots or more, and it will literally, if you hold your arms out and put your jacket out, you will easily get blown away. Wow. It takes you off your feet. I didn't expect that to be the answer. Then. I'll be honest, I thought you were going to say no, no, no. <laughs> but there we go. Um, what's your favorite sort of animals that you see in the Antarctic? 
I think for me, the Gen 2 penguins, I think they're great. They have this particular stance and they always look like this when they're walking along. Um, I think they're great, really charismatic little penguins. And yourself? For me, the emperors every day, yes, they are so warm and so friendly. Then uh, the emperor penguins have always got a piece of my heart for sure. Amazing. What's the rarest thing you've seen? Asks Cameron North in Halifax Grammar School. I'm Sorry, say, Cameron in North Halifax Grammar School. For me, again, lucky enough to winter, you get the aurora lights, and now that's pretty, pretty special to see that during the winter time. Wow. Yeah. Kids, if you haven't seen the aurora lights, then you should Google that and have a look and see exactly what we're talking about because it's fabulous. And that's amazing. Have you, have you seen the I've aurora lights? I've not seen the aurora lights down no. there, no. The aurora lights, sorry, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, next time. When are you next going? Oh, hopefully over the next few years, but I'm not entirely sure. I've just come back, so oh, just I'm all back. right for the so moment. So you've had your fix? Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, this question's about uh, how big the largest iceberg is uh, in the Antarctic, uh, but I saw something in the news recently about something breaking off. Can yes. you tell us a little bit about that? So um, the Brunt Ice Shelf, which is where Halley sits, um, it, it carves icebergs all the time, but recently it carved a m off a mega iceberg, which is actually the size of about Greater London. Um, so it's it's absolutely massive. So the um, iceberg is the size of Greater London. London. Wow. Yeah. And Huge. that's broken away. Yeah, it's just floating in the sea. And is that a problem? Um, not necessarily. Um, it will eventually carve into smaller icebergs, which is uh, much more manageable. But if it gets too um, very close to, say, somewhere like South Georgia, it can prevent animals from accessing, um, you know, their, the places where they feed or where they nest, things like that. So, but in essence, that's what the ice shelves do. They carve off big chunks of ice all the time. So it's a, it's a natural process. But we, so we don't need to panic. We don't need to. Okay, panic. that's a really okay. Um, where do you sleep? That's from Lucy Ambrose. Where do you sleep? Well, most of the time you sleep in a nice warm bed, either in the new Discovery House when that comes online, but you do get a chance to sleep in a tent, so you can witness some pretty cold temperatures. I've slept in a tent at a sort of minus 55, and that's pretty chilly sleeping in a tent at those sort of temperatures. Okay, I'll come to my last question from Christopher, who asks, and off the back of that, how do you keep warm and have you ever hiked up a mountain? So Christopher, you get two <coughs> questions there, sneaky. How do you keep warm and have you ever hiked up a mountain? Uh, yes, I've hiked up mountains. How do you keep warm? Well, Matt's discussed earlier yeah. on how you keep warm, and that's uh, definitely the way. But the, the biggest thing is when you hike up a mountain, you get too warm and too sweaty. So you have to take all the clothing off at the same time whilst you're getting hot and put it all back on when you stop and get to the top. And have you ever hiked up a mountain? Uh, I haven't hiked up a mountain at Rothera, but I have hiked up a mountain at South Georgia. And that's amazing because you can see this amazing, clear turquoise water, and then you see glaciers in the distance just coming off the mountain, and it's absolutely beautiful. It sounds so fantastic, all these glaciers and penguins and everything we've heard about today. But we are over time. Again, apologies because we've gone over. That's live TV, everyone. I'm sorry. Um, but we've had the most fantastic time here at the British Antarctic Survey in Cambridge. I'd like to say a massive thank you to you two and all of your colleagues who we've met today who've made us feel so very, very welcome and taught us so much about life on ice. Thanks for joining us today. It's been a pleasure to have you along and we'll see you for the next live lesson. Bye. Bye.